Good morning, everybody. Oh, it's great to see so many people stupid enough to get up this early on a Sunday morning. <laughs> Who hurt themselves last night? No? Oh, you're all lying. I was smart. I went to bed at 2 o'clock. But that's early. If you've been doing this for years, you know that's very, very early. Okay, so, so I've got a little Sam Elliott voice going here. All right. Uh, our first presenter of the day entered the United States Air Force in 1979 and served 27 years both in active and reserve duty. He is currently retired from the Air Force Reserves. He had various assignments throughout his Air Force career that has taken him all over the world. His most notable assignment uh, began in 1979 when he was assigned as a security police law enforcement patrolman at RAF Bentwaters, England. Uh, Bentwaters is a twin base with RAF Woodbridge, uh, and together they amassed the largest tactical uh, fighter wing in the United States Air Force. In the early morning hours of December 26, 1980, while working a law enforcement, for, law enforcement patrol at RAF Woodbridge, he had a life-changing event where he conducted an investigation on a phenomenon which has left the rest of the world in awe of the most documented and witnessed sighting by the United States military in known history. He has worked very hard since then to understand what happened to uh, him and everybody else that night. Through the Freedom of Information Act, uh, he has tried to uncover documents that could shed light on his experience and the entire UFO phenomenon. And this is no easy task, um, trying to get that's, I don't know, that's like trying to squeeze, you know, uh, juice out of a stone. And, uh, but he's worked very hard at that. And he has come to the conclusion that expecting disclosure from the military industrial complex is a dead end. Um, I, I, this is one of these things that we all hope for disclosure, but I'll give you a little analogy. Um, if you went to your bank and you went to the banker and you said, please give me some money, okay, would they do that? Let's say you don't have an account there. No, they would not. Okay, and you know they've got the money in the vault, but they're not giving you any. There's the reason is, for one, that's not their job, and two, it's not in their best interest. Okay, so um, that's kind of like what asking, asking the government to educate us about this is like that. So John is going to tell you about, um, about these ideas today. He's going to speak uh, to them very extensively. So join me in welcoming John Burroughs. Thanks. Um, thank you all for being here, like you said, this early on a Sunday morning. Um, I want to thank Ozarks for bringing me down. I'm going to kind of cross the bridge today. Um, I'm going from being a witness to uh, actually, I conducted some investigations. I've been working on some stuff, and I'm going to go into that today. For those of you that don't know a lot about Rendlesham as far as the incident itself, I'm not going to really cover that today, but I'll give you a brief synopsis. It was an incident that took place over a three-night period in the United Kingdom at Aria Bentwaters Woodbridge. At that point in time, the uh, base was the largest tech fighter wing in the Air Force. I've heard people say it was the largest uh, wing in the NATO, but actually it was the largest tech fighter wing in the United States Air Force. Happened over three nights. The first and third night I was involved. The first night, along with my uh, partner that I was working with at Woodbridge, we saw strange lights in the forest. Uh, security patrol was sent down. We went ahead and went out and did an investigation. And uh, the th second night, they saw lights again. Some interesting things happened involving that on-duty flight. Then the third night, I'm sure most of you are aware, that's when Colonel Hall took a team out there. I also was out there at some point. And you've got the memo that was written afterwards, and you have the uh, halt tape that if you've never listened to it, you should take the time to find it on the Internet because that's actually one of the few times you'll find something that took place, especially in the military, where it was actually recorded live. So you can hear some of what went on and their reactions and what they saw and everything. So, without further ado, today's agenda is, the DOD admits UAP slash UFOs exist de facto. Okay, and before I go into the de facto part, I don't know how many of you have been following what's been going on with John Podesta lately and Hillary Clinton. Um, I'm not going to get into politics because that's, you talk about UFOs getting nasty sometimes, but, okay. <laughs> but politics is worse. Um, the interesting thing, and I think one of the things they read quite a bit on the internet is when they bring up Hillary, there's a lot of people that don't like her. 
and they're really going hard after her. You can't trust her. You, you're not, she's not going to tell you anything anyway, which may be very true. At the end of the day, what she said, and how many heard, you either heard or saw what she said on Jimmy Kimmel? Okay. I, one of the interesting things about that, and when I heard it, I almost fell out of my chair because some of it really does have to do with what I'm going to discuss today. But if you didn't catch this, go back and watch it. It's on the internet. She said there's a new nomenclature now for UFOs. Does anybody know what she said that was? UAPs, right? And that's what we're, I'm going to go into extensively today. But it was just very strange even for me to hear her say that. And the other thing that was strange is usually Kimmel has sitting presidents on, usually in their second term, and they still don't tell them anything. But here we've got a lady that hasn't even won the party's nomination coming on like she's already going to win the nomination, win the presidency, and when she does, she's going to open up an investigation. Well, what he said earlier was interesting. Will they tell us anything? I don't know. She did say one thing that stuck out. She said, we're going to open it up. We're going to look at it. And if it's not a national security issue, we'll talk about what isn't. So that was an interesting point. And as far as the national security part, obviously, I think people want disclosure, but you have to stop and think of it this way. I was in the military, and the people that were in the military, I think will understand this better. There is a national security factor, and if there's certain things involving technology and everything else, they do hold that back, you know, from the public, from other nations and stuff. But like I said, there is a chance, and I'm not telling you to go vote for her because I'm not a big fan myself, but um, there is a chance that through the efforts of John Podesta, if she is elected, something might at least attempt to move forward. Um, I'm going to go into my FOIA requests, not only with the Department of Defense, but with the MOD. And then I'm going to talk, this will all tie into my investigation. When I started this in 2009, when I got really serious about it, um, I was having health problems. I had been having them since right after the incident, but it wasn't extreme. So when I initially got into it, my goal was we had the 30th anniversary coming up. I wanted to try to get as many people together, if possible, get as many of us over to the UK. Because believe it or not, in just short of 30 years, most of us had never gotten together all together at one time. And there's a lot of other people that had involvement in this that chose to remain silent or had done small little interviews down the road. But we never have all gotten together since the incident took place and discussed what we saw and we didn't saw. So I started with that. And then after I came back in 10, which it wasn't very successful getting all the people together, but we, some of Jim and I went over for the 30th reunion. I got back and I started getting really sick. So that really pushed me forward on what my investigation. Okay, I'm gonna start with going into some of the people that were involved. And the first person, I'm sure you heard him um, on Friday, was Nick Pope. He was former director of the Defense Secretary, Minister of Defense. And he went on the record saying this years ago. And if I'm not, I believe the first time he said it was there was a sci-fi documentary that was done with Brian Gumbel. And I think that was coming up on the 20th anniversary. But he made a comment in this documentary, and I happened to, I wasn't in this particular one, but I happened to hear him say this, and he says, I've gone on the record saying Rendlesham might be the turning point in history that leads to the explanation of UFO phenomenon. Okay, this was some of the, it was called, what I call the chain of our command, the command that was on, in charge at the time of the incident. The first person on your left was General Gabriel. He was in charge of, of the whole theater in Europe, USAFE. And he came in right after the incident, gathered up all the relevant reports, records, documentation. Some people, and there's been some documentaries where one of the security police um, shift commanders said that actually General Williams flew some stuff over, but also some of the other evidence. He took it all. He cleansed the base of information and took it all to Ramstein. That's a pretty high-level brass we look into in an obscure event as descriptive by Halt's memo. Gabriel said that virtually nothing, nothing about the events, nor will he, having passed away in 2003. The other thing was, when CNN did their investigations after the News of the World broke the story, 
they came in and started asking for all these documents. And the official response was they lost them. Okay, General Williams at the time was a colonel and he was our wing commander. And for the military people, they understand what that means. There's two different levels of command on Air Force bases for the most part, especially if they have an active air wing. Um, you have the wing commander, which he actually is the, the, has the final say. He's the overall boss. And then you have the base commander. He was the, the boss at the time. Um, he told Georgina Bruni, and I don't know how many of you have read the book, You Can't Tell the People, um, that there are more things in the universe than we may ever know about. And he was open to the possibility that an advanced civilization would have the technology to cut through time. In March of 1983, Colonel Conrad, who was our base commander, did an interview with um, AJ Sally Rail. She was with Omni Magazine. Now, this was when everything was starting to get pick up, the, the, the uh, memo was leaked and stuff was going on. And I have met with Colonel Conrad in the last few years, and he basically told me he was the one picked to be, not necessarily the cover up, but be the spokesman to um, cover for the wing commander and, and the other people involved. And he told Sally that those lads saw something, but I don't know what it was. So again, he confirms that this was not like some people, the debunkers especially say, we were fooled by the lighthouse, the planets, the stars. You know, we were out there on drugs. We didn't know what we were seeing. Um, they've, they've accused Colonel Hall of not knowing what he was talking about, yet he, prior to being the deputy base commander, he was in Vietnam as a combat controller. And I think anybody that knows the military, that means that's observation, bringing airplanes in and out. So the, he, they're trying to sell the fact that the combat controller was fooled by the planets, the stars, and the lighthouse. Okay. Colonel Hall was the deputy base commander and led a team out there on the third night. He did an interview with Lee Spiegel, who now writes for the Huffington Post, that if the full truth were to come out, it would become completely change the way people look at reality. He also did another interview prior to that with some British investigators, and he said that you should, it, it's, and he's changed the story now in the last few years, but at that point in time, he said, look less at UFOs and aliens and look more at the technical end. But I'll go into what he has said just recently. Okay, RAF squadron leader Moreland, he was the one that Halt wrote the letter for, forwarded to him, he did an interview with Keith Beebe, which was, he worked for the News of the World at the time, September of 83, and said that I put the events down to an inexplicable phenomenon. So as you can see, everybody involved in the chain of command, including Nick Pope, who, who came into this later, he was a little kid, I think, at the time, when this first <laughs> took place. You know, he could tell you later how old he was, but he might have even still been in diapers. But, <laughs> but he, um, he did a cold case review in the later years. But ultimately, as you can see, everybody that was put on the spot early on didn't blow it off, say nothing happened, um, didn't try to make it look like it was easily explained, okay? All right, now I'm gonna go in. Last year when I came down, Linda did a presentation on part of it involved what was going on with the VA and stuff at the time. I had a lot of questions that I saw people in the hallway. So I'm gonna go into this today a little bit further and then I'll tell you what exactly is going on at this very moment. Okay. This is the Arizona Department of Veterans Affair rating decision. Okay. So to give you a quick, quick synopsis, um, I got sick when I returned from the United Kingdom for the 30th anniversary. Uh, everybody when we were over there had health issues, except I, I had a little bit of a cold, but a lot of people got sick, even Linda who was there, got really sick during that time frame. So when I got back to the States, I started showing some of the same symptoms that they did. So I just thought I had some bronchitis and I didn't feel good. But this kept lingering, so about two to three weeks in, it would have been sometime um, maybe it was even longer than that, actually, it was in early February. Um, I finally just got to the point where I was even having trouble sleeping and breathing. So I went into uh, urgent care on, on the weekend, and I just said, I think I've got bronchitis, I may need some medication. Well, they took me back and they put me on EKG, and next thing I know, I'm on the way to the hospital because I was an AFib, congestive heart failure. And 
So I went to the hospital, they did all this stuff, they, I got out, the doctor was a little perplexed at the time, and this was the beginning of this, but I got better, they put me on some medication, I actually got better, and by the summer, it was really strange, because when, when I was going back for my follow-up in June, happened in February actually, um, I was fine, and they had done a bunch of testing, and I had um, private insurance, and they had tested my heart for everything possible, heart disease, you know, you know, damage or arteries clogged, nothing was there. And he wanted to do one further test, but it was denied by the insurance agency because it was an expensive test where they go into your leg and go up, and, and, and they wouldn't even let him do it because the stress test and everything else showed no symptoms that would even authorize paying for that kind of test. And he was just kind of like, well, sometimes these things are just unexplainable. So, um, went over a year and I was fine, and then all of a sudden in the following summer, in July, I actually got super sick. And got taken, rushed down, I was up in the mountains in Sedona, got taken down to Phoenix, ended up in Mesa at the Heart Institute, Banner Heart. And this time my heart, and I don't know how many people understand fracture rates, but at the point in time when I went into emergency room and was transferred, it was down to 10%. The doctor told me at that moment I was the walking dead. He was almost surprised I was still alive. Um, they tried to stabilize me. I was there for a few days, and then finally they came in, and they just weren't, they couldn't figure out what was the problem. And my, the cardiologist that I was dealing with, one of them, he wasn't a surgeon, but he, he just comes into me, and he, he was different than a lot of these doctors. He did his rounds at night, so he'd wake you up in the middle of the night. Okay, so you, and anybody's had heart issues knows it's hard enough to sleep anyway. And they wake you up all night doing these checks and everything. So not only that, I'm getting woke up by my doctor at two o'clock in the morning. <laughs> but he starts talking to me and he says, we're just perplexed. We're gonna have to do a possible procedure because we can't understand what's going on with the heart. The only thing we think could be the problem is there's something wrong with the wiring in the heart. If you don't get this procedure done, and there was, there was kind of an argument went on and I held off for a couple more days, but they wanted to do an ablation on my heart, put me on a pacemaker defibrillator, and um, stabilize my heart that way. And the surgeon came in and gave me the same push. But he was talking to me, and he's just like, going along the way, like, how, I, when did this first happen? And he was on the assumption, like most people, well, it had to have been at birth, because most people are, are born with, um, with, with the defect. I wasn't, and I'll go into that shortly. But, so, anyway, getting to this problem, the basic problem was I eventually went to Senator Kyle, which I'll go into in a little bit. I went to Senator Kyle, stuff started rolling because of the request of my private doctor to get my records and stuff. But ultimately, what ended up coming down was I got a letter back after they evaluated me and they denied everything. They denied, they denied the fact that I had a heart problem because when I was in the military. Um, the, I had no back problems either, which was interesting because at first they said they had some of my medical records and wouldn't let me see them, and that was the back problems happened after the incident, but they denied my back claim. And um, they denied service connection for vision condition. I also got, had vision problems from this also, but they just denied everything. And the reason why, this was the actual, this is the actual letter setting up they were classified, but Getting into what happened with Senator Kyle, they looked into, um, they started looking into this because they wanted my medical records, they wanted my service records. And when they first did the initial um, request, they weren't where they were supposed to be. And the particular aid, and I don't know how many of you've dealt with Congress senators or congressmen, everybody thinks it's the congressman that does all the work, it's not, it's the aides. They're involved in all this. And depending on how long somebody's been in is what type of aid they have. And Kyle had been around for a long time and he had a really good one. And she was, a very, she was an older lady and she had dealt with a lot of the Agent Orange issues. Agent Orange issues. And so how it ends up coming out was after they did the initial response, they didn't get anything. They were told they weren't where it was. But she then started doing further inquiries and she sent me this saying, Thank you for contacting my office, or Senator Kyle did, to request assistance with obtaining your military medical records. 
The Department of Air Force advised these records were forwarded to the Department of Veterans Affairs Records Management Center in St. Louis, Missouri. Their telephone number is this. A claim must be made with the VA before classified records can be requested. So here's the first sign in writing that my records, my medical records are classified, which totally took me off guard. I mean, I would never have thought that I understand I was in an incident and I got sick, but why would my records be classified? Okay, well, what I had to do was, and this was at this point, this was prior to my second episode. She said I had to go in, had to file for disability, and then bring her all the paperwork, and that's when they would start pushing for my records. And at the time, it wasn't known, and this was revealed to some members, ex members of Congress at the citizens' hearing that Stephen Bassett had, which a lot of them were, um, were aware of. Mel Cook left when we did the initial brief. And we came back for a second session. He called up some people behind the scenes and an attorney, and they said, this, 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 this don't work that way. They're just, it's not. He's supposed to be able to have access to his records, especially for medical care. But so I did the request, okay? And it was because my civilian doctors had no access. Like I said, Senator Kyle's office really um, revealed for the first time my records were classified. And she said she found out about it working on Agent Orange. And they were, they were running into restrictions and things that they couldn't get at. And eventually she went to DC to work with, oh, up there and they found that there's a classified record section. Medical records are classified. Okay, my medical records are related to Rendlesham. It has to do with the damage to my heart, issues with my vision, the natures of these issues are very significant. And like I said, it appears they want it hidden. <laughs> but there, are, there is some outside interest from other agencies that they consider this critical evidence. All right, now, on that denial stuff I went into when they denied it, I went in and saw the VA doctor for evaluation and she started asking me questions about my condition and everything. And, and she all of a sudden just stopped me at this, with this perplexed look and she just stopped me. She said, look, all the things you're telling me aren't possible. And I says, what do you mean they're not possible? She says, you weren't in the Air Force when you claimed this happened. And I'm looking at her like, what do you mean? She says, the records we have show that you weren't in the Air Force in 1979. That's what the Department of Veterans Affairs had. What the DOD sent them was, John Burroughs was not in the United States Air Force, okay? So she's looking at me like, so this is just impossible. Why are you wasting my time? Well, I had a briefcase with me and I pulled out some records, my pay records, my entry. I did happen to have my entry physical, which showed it was done in 79. And the damage I got, when I got out in 88. Now, she was playing dumb, because later on through some more investigations, I did uncover some stuff. But she um, said, looked at it, her eyes got big, and I said, and what? Now what do we do? You're saying I wasn't in, you're acting like none of this matters, but I've got proof that I am in. And she says, well, it's gonna be decided by a higher pay grade than myself. So it was pretty much short and sweet after that. A couple more questions, have a nice day. You know, but here is my DD form 214 that was used by the Veterans Affairs to say that this is what they used to evaluate what I was injured when I said it was. As you can see, date entered active duty was 1982. So there was no records of my service during the time frame. Now, when this happened, Kyle had retired he had me go to McCain. And I had to start all over. He's the one that got me in, because there was all these VA issues on late appointments getting people in anyway. He got that expedited, and then this all happened. So I told the staffer this, and she was kind of like stunned, but she says, let's see what happens. So several months later, I get the letter that I showed you a minute ago saying, you're denied. That's when things got really crazy because that really got him fired up in McCain's office, right? So one of the things they were able to do, and this took a lot of effort, okay? And the chief staffer, which is McCain's main man, and he's in Phoenix, he's not in DC, they have he's people there. 
but he, was, he got involved with this, people in DC got involved with this, but his comment was it took a yeoman's job to get your DD Form 214 corrected, but we may never be able to gain access to the missing United States Air Force medical records from 79 to 83. And as you can see, they did go back and they changed it to 1979. But there was a fiasco with that. They were calling an AFRPC the night that I was in. They wouldn't, they wouldn't deal with them. So I called up there and I got told, you weren't in, prove it. And I'm like, my records show I was in. No, they don't, prove it. And I got an email from them that saying I wasn't in and stuff. And, and one of the things that I got from this nasty person saying that, well, even if you say you were in, prove that you were at the base you were at when this supposedly happened. So I'm like, okay. And I really, because she was starting to get the same feelings I got when I approached people about this. I was like, kind of like going, what do you mean you can't get my records? What do you mean you can't do this? So I sat there after I talked to her, called up myself, and I sat there and started thinking about this. And I went, you know what? I want to try one more thing. So I made a phone call back up there, but I went to retirements. And the lady answered, and she ended up being somebody who had been stationed with me at Castle, believe it or not, at one point. So we started talking. She says, well, what do you need? I says, well, I'm just calling to verify I'm not retired. And she says, what do you mean? And I go, well, I'm not retired, according to the United States Air Force. She starts laughing. What, is this a joke? I go, no, I'm not. I can't be. I wasn't in the Air Force until 1982. Therefore, I'm not retired. She goes, what? And then she started going into my records, right? And she goes, no, no, we have it all right here. You were in in 79, we have all this stuff. And I go, well, according to AFRPC, they don't. And she goes in and they, you know how when they go in, they document stuff now? She looks at, she goes, yeah, you just did get off the phone with them, didn't you? And she goes, that's interesting that they would say this because they had the same access to the same records that you, that I do. She says, you were clearly in and had already bent waters in 1979. And she goes, this really pisses me off. (laughs) So she says, here's what I'm going to do for you. She says, I'm going to certify all these records right now, and I'm going to forward them to Senator McCain's office. And she did do that. And that's when that part got changed, because they were not going to budge with me at all. Okay, and like I said, I got proactive with Senator McCain's. I did do some press releases also. I sent a letter to the House, Senate, VA Oversight Committees to include Bernie Sanders. And let me tell you, if you're a Bernie fan, I'm not, because Bernie blew me off. (laughs) He had actually didn't want to touch with the 10-foot pole, and and finally the final acknowledgement was, um, McCain will deal with it, not me even though he was sitting over the committee, the oversight committee at the time, and he had more power than McCain did, okay? And also during this time frame, all of a sudden, some intelligence agencies all of a sudden magically started getting interested in my uh, condition, okay? They eventually, and this got very complicated too, but they eventually, back and forth, and it looked like they were gonna do something because the heat really started coming down and they were gonna do something. They, they told me to, after the denial was done, I did an appeal, they finally told McCain's office to, to, to withdraw the appeal, do a, it's a call to um, quick, it's, I forget exactly, I don't have it in front of me, but there was a way you could do it based on new information, which by the way, it already was old information because it was all submitted the first time, but they said they were gonna get this expedited and get it taken care of. But some time went by and nothing. Next thing I know, I get a letter in the mail saying that the case was closed. Thank you for withdrawing your appeal, we're closing the case. And I'd done everything I was supposed to to do that, but fortunately McCain's office documented everything. So when I got the letter, I called right away. She went ballistic. So she starts calling her sources in the VA and they're like, what do you mean he got a letter denying him? <laughs> I was the one that was the head supervisor down there. I was the one that was involved in all this. Let me look into this. A couple hours later, she gets a phone call, calls me back. They were shitting their pants down in Phoenix. <laughs> okay, she said, no, you did submit all this. They're saying you did, and I understand, but I was personally the one that did it. She still had the backup information. She said, this was killed way above my pay grade, way up in D.C. And she said, now I'm going to get in trouble for something that 
I did the proper way. So we did immediately, we did um, what you call um, a complaint through their IG. That was filed. And they actually came back and they assigned somebody that was one, supposedly, this is coming from McCain's office, so I never was directly involved. They assigned somebody that understands classified material. They assigned the lady that helped her originally and they had a manager that everything, those three worked on it, okay? So they started working and she gets this phone call from this guy in the classified materials section within a day or two and she says, what the hell did he get into? She go, he goes, I've never seen records locked down like this. We can't get access at it. Okay. So at the end of the day, they finally, in, in January of 2015, I got a letter from the VA. She got it first that they, they granted me full disability. Okay. But there's a caveat to this, okay? You got your disability, now go away. And what I mean by that is, we're not gonna give you your medical records. They're still classified. We're not gonna give them to them. We're not gonna acknowledge exactly where they are, why they're classified or anything else. I got a follow-up letter from them saying, and basically I talked to her and she said, well, their stance is you got what you asked for. They're not helping you with the rest. You're never gonna see your records as we told you earlier. The VA doctors that need to know this, that have the clearance level to handle you on your heart will deal with you. And if you want to pursue this further, get a good lawyer because this is going to go up the federal court system. So that's how it ended up. Ended up. So yes, the government's taking care of me overall, but they're still not going to answer my medical records to this day. And I'll never have them. And yes, people, you are right that no, I do have a legal right to them. But I can't even get an... Um, a real reason why, because they do have a right under national security issues to classify things. But what's interesting is they normally just redact or take out that area and you get the rest of your records. I don't get access to any of my records. None of them are I have access to, which is even stranger, because they really shouldn't be doing that. Okay. I also, during that time frame, and right before my surgery, I started a very active FOIA, a FOIA request to include, the MOD was the one right prior to my surgery and afterwards, but we did some um, FOIA with the United States government also early on. Two things have become apparent. The MOD has not released all of their UFO UAP documentation contrary to their statements. The State Department and the United States Air Force are in contradiction in regards to the runs from documents held. We sent a FOIA request to the State Department. They admitted that they were holding records on the Reynolds incident, okay? And they stated that they weren't, they weren't the original owner. They came from the Air Force. And if you're overseas, the State Department handles anything with a foreign government because it's considered an international incident. So even OSI, if there's an incident, reports to the State Department. So whatever happened to us, the State Department got involved. But, but the big thing to this was, well, yeah, we've got them, but the Air Force is going to have to allow them to be released. So we contact the Air Force. The Air Force says, I don't know what you're talking about. The only people that might have any documents are the MOD. Contact the MOD. So we go back to the State Department, and they just basically tell the lawyer, well, they're not going to release them. Free between the lines. Okay. Now we're getting into the MOD stuff. How many of you remember the big thing they did at the end that they were done? Everything is released, right? All documents were released. We're done. We've told you everything. Just like, was it Blue Book, the Condon Report? We're done. There's nothing to it. They had this guy who took Nick, Nick Pope's place when Nick moved to the States go into this. And you can read it. I'm not going to read all the way through it. But he basically says that the last pieces of the puzzle have finally been revealed with the insight into the last days of the UFO desk, which, by the way, Nick was on at one point. After 60 years, it's no longer needed to keep tabs on sightings, even those made by credible people, all right? This seemingly act of transparency was apparently a ruse, as FOIA requests by myself have revealed to the further vision, version of the truth. They said they released them to the archives. I did FOIA on it, and I did it based off a of condom, which I'll go into in a minute, all right? All of a sudden, 
I get, I get this response back. I did it right before my surgery, and after I get out of my surgery in the spring, I get a response back from the MOD. Now, I'm gonna tell you this, and I'm not trying to bag on people, but most of the, by today's standards, most UFO investigators been in for years have kind of grown weary of FOIA. Because early on, I guess when Clinton was president, they had some good results, but they've been kind of locking everything down since then. And you just don't get anything. So the couple of people I was talking about doing this didn't think it was gonna get anything. But lo and behold, they respond back to me. They're holding six crucial UFO UAP policy papers. Okay, policy papers. Now, why would you have policy papers if UFOs or UAPs aren't of defense significance, right? Okay. And these particular papers date back from 1971 through 2004. These papers contain the MOD public information policy for over three decades, including change from the use term UFO to UAP in June of 2000. What did Hillary just talk about on Jimmy Kimmel? There's a new nomenclature, UAPs. The American government, it appears, is trying to recondition the American public to no longer using the word UFO, but UAP. Because after all, think about it, she was the Secretary of State. And not only was she the Secretary of State, she was the Secretary of State during my FOIA request. Okay? In response to a follow-up, they changed their story and admitted they were now holding 18 files remaining to be released at a future date to include the information on the Rendlesham Forest incident. They claim releasing them to me would delay the yet-to-be-decided release date. Okay, here's, is, here's a summary of, as you can see, my FOIA request. Okay, they go into this by saying, let me, let me take the key lines. I understand that there's been misleading statements on certain websites and newspapers suggesting the MLD has released its final um, group of UFO files. Well, misleading is not the word for it. It was on their own MOD website, okay? <laughs> and not only that, Nick Pope, and I'm not trying to give him a hard time, was out there preaching that they had released all of them too. The ex-MOD employee that had worked at the UFO desk, okay? So now you've got, and then you've got this David Clark that took his place. They're all over the place. It's over, we're done, there's nothing more, blah, 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 right? Okay? It says the National Archives, okay, how did it go? Prior to your request coming in, prior to my request coming in now, they're saying that they already were working on this. The MOD had decided to publish all remaining files on these subjects to the National Archives. There are 18 remaining files to include six policy files being prepared for release to the archives. They are currently being prepared and they will be released by the department to the archives within three months. Note the date, March of 2014. So they're saying by early summer they were gonna be released. Okay, it's likely that it will take the archives around nine months to process the files. So we, may, we estimate they will be available to the general public and yourself within one year. That would have been in 2015. <laughs> we still haven't even gotten them to the archives to this day, folks. Okay, on top of it all off, that it's twice now went to the Florida House of Lords. There was a particular Lord, I think his name's Blackwell, that got involved and said, wait a minute, you said you had these files, when are you gonna release them? Oh, we're working on it, we're working on it, we're working on it. Okay, now, after Nick finds out I had done this, he makes an official response by saying, I've known for sure that not everything has been released because the MODs, by the MOD's own admission, some files documents have been lost, some destroyed, some redacted. Does everybody understand what redacted means? That means it's still classified, <laughs> okay? And some was held altogether. Hint, hint. They're still holding back other files, all right, that are still classified completely. Also material where the information owner is a defense contractor, some of Project Condine's working papers. You understand what they're doing now, American and British government, other governments. They're taking all this information, handing it over to the depart their um, defense industries. It now becomes um, patented, 
And the, when you do a FOIA request, they can just deny it. They don't know anything about it because technically they don't. It belongs to the defense contractors who handle it. And I don't know if you follow it, but a lot of ex people inside these agencies, the government and stuff, military people, magically get jobs in the defense industry doing the same thing they did for the government. The bottom line, he says, is that whether it's exempt from FOIA entirely, withheld, redacted under exemptions to FOIA, destroyed or lost, lost, some material on Project Condine and on Reynoldson Forest incident has yet to be emerged, and some may never come to light. Nick Pope. Okay, when I, when I was pushing this, when I first got this all released, I kind of stayed quiet for a while. I wanted to see what they were gonna do. So this happened in the spring. By the fall, nothing. Nothing was said by the government about they were gonna do these files. Now remember back to their response, we're working on them three months from now, they'll be at the National Archives. We're gonna get them released to the public. So they were implying the public was about to find out, right? We're now in September, nothing. Well, I'm going over to the UK for some other stuff. I do some press releases. I don't get any really response back, but when I finish my business, when my planes wheels up on the way back to the United States, this is true, they, initi- they did this on the Daily Star's webpage, right? I had only been in the air 20 minutes and this was released on the Daily Star by the MOD, okay? <laughs> you can't make this stuff up, folks. It really happened that way. Exclusive British government to make 18 more UFO files available. The Ministry of Defense has announced further top, this is their words, top secret UFO files are to be made publicly available. This was published in December of 2014. We're now, what, in March of 2016? They're still not released, folks. Okay, I'm going to go into the phenomena now, okay? I call a phenomena confirmed. Okay, as Einstein says, no problem can be solved from the same level of consciousness that created it. Here we go with Nick again. The question has to be asked, why though they were aware of it in general terms, did the media and the UFO community miss the significance of Project Condine? Now, I'm not gonna read through this whole thing, take a minute to look at it, but basically what he said was it was a technical report written for only certain people, I think it was eight people originally, was high up in the MOD, and that even though UFO investigators, because it was released in 2006, got their hands on it, they were almost what I told you earlier when I was trying to do FOIA, we're to the point now, well, here's some more crap from them, it's not gonna mean anything in it, there's nothing to it, we're not even gonna take the time to look through it but he made some very valid points on why people have missed and to this day still have overlooked Condine. You guys had enough time to look at that? Is it too small? All right, I'm, that's why some of the other stuff I've left out. All right, I'll do my best here, folks. Nick Pope feels in relation to the media, Project, Con- Project Condine's final report ran to over 460 pages and busy journalists working to tight deadlines seldom have time to wade through such vast amounts of material. Okay, this leads to what a fairly well-known trick within government when you have to release something difficult. Because of the Freedom of Information Act, bury the embarrassing beat, uh, bits deep in a lengthy report and put your key messages up front in the executive summary or better still, in a covering press release with an intention getting, quote, the chances are that's what a lot of media outlets will run with. Material is thus hidden in plain sight. It's a classic example of the odd adage that the best place to hide a book is in a library. In relationship to the UFO community, the aforementioned points apply too. But even when you follow, just did run through the entire report, it was written in such a way that many of the important points were lost. This was a report written by a scientific and a technical intelligence specialist, writing for an audience of similar specialists, and the material simply wouldn't be um, comprehensible to most members of the public. Additionally, several key parts of the report were redacted, which is classified still. As the material is still classified or sensitive, and many of the supporting papers that led to the final report are similarly redacted or are outside the scope of the Freedom of Information Act. Accordingly, it's extremely difficult to get such a full picture of Project Condine or to um, 
Yeah, the information. Contextualized, right? All right. Edgar Mitchell, God rest his soul. He's passed now. But he had this quote. I happen to be privileged enough to be in, in, in on the fact that we have been visited on this planet and the UFO phenomenon is real. And there was an um, interview he did, I think three or four, maybe five years. It's on the internet. He did it with a, rep- uh, a radio show in, um, in the UK. Now, he said things prior to this and after this, but what was interesting about this interview was he implied that there was something here that we've been visited by, but we haven't yet been visited from out there or up there, okay? And this guy was going nuts and didn't ask him the right questions. He was like, kept going, I can't believe an astronaut would say this. No, no, I don't. There's crazies out there that say it all the time, but not an astronaut. But you need to listen to that. There's a 10 minute breakdown of it. It's very interesting what he said. Phenomena confirmed. It's time to address the core issue. There is a phenomena no one officially wants to talk about. Thus society lives inside a false reality. And what I mean by society, it's not people like you guys that are here that are trying to research and follow it, but the general everyday public who barely survives working kids, sports events, everything else, paying bills, they get their 50 second clips from CNN, Fox, or now the paper, you don't even read, you read these little articles on the internet. They're the ones that they read something, and if you notice sometimes how something gets said, like, and I'm not a Donald Trump fan, but he now is a racist, but he didn't say it that way as far as Muslims go. But they've turned this all around, and a lot of people are running around clearly saying he's a racist, but they've misdirected a lot of what he said. So, so the, thus society lives inside a false reality overall. It's time to admit it exists in the real world. Certain MOD documents hold the key. They have never properly been analyzed. There is a phenomenon, I think everyone here would agree to that, hopefully, that is essential to the truth of Rendlesham. All my VA support issues result, revolve around avoiding that fact. As a society, we are acting like a kid who pretends if he denies something, it does not exist. This does not serve society well. It's like the church, Catholic Church refusing to look through Galileo's telescope for fear of what they might, would see. The 1% narrative. Eventually, a small percent of the population holds the vast percentage of material wealth. The 99% of the Occupy movement represent dissatisfaction with total inequity. Conversely, a large percentage of the population understands we are not alone. A critical small percent of the society insists upon keeping that fact a secret. The catch-22 of denial. Science and academia can't openly study the phenomenon because it is supposed not to exist. Data outside the box of accepted scientific content is not considered valid. Thus, the claim there is no evidence. Until they study the evidence, they cannot understand the phenomenon. Until they admit it exists, they can't study it. (laughs) Well, I'm going to say something, though, that I've just, I've gotten more involved in this. Um, I don't know how many you're aware of, but I do a radio show every Thursday night between 8 and 10 Eastern on KGRA with Linda Moulton Howe. And... The show is called Phenomena Radio, and what we've been doing is bringing a lot of people, scientists in, besides other people like George Knapp has been on and stuff. Um, but we've been getting into the technical side of this. And what is starting to become apparent, we had, uh, I, I think his last name was Dr. Evans on, and he was involved in Project Green, Green Glow, which was, uh, he was a UK scientist, and it has to do with um, gravitics and stuff. But anyway, um, when we were doing the interview, it got, because I started asking technical questions, he kept saying things are classified, things are classified, I can't go there, I can't talk about this. So I'm starting to possibly afford some opinion, not of all, but a lot of these guys are really in the black world. And, but they also are trying to do some work in the white world, and then they claim that they can't really 
you know, can't study it. Well, they really are. What they can't do is talk about it. The good stuff they're working on behind a lot of these guys, not all of them, but a lot of them are working with the government and they're involved in classified material, which is the black world. And they can't, they know a lot more, but they can't talk about it, just like Kim, because all this stuff is classified. So if it's classified, I think that would mean it was defense significance, wouldn't you say? Okay, I feel personally, this is my take, and it's kind of getting reinforced right now, disclosure is a dead letter. Stephen Greer sends every new president a briefing paper. It's never acknowledged. The citizens hearing panel sent the president and the UN a joint letter presenting their conclusions. It wasn't acknowledged. Admitting there is a phenomenon is a political impossibility. Disclosure is politically impossible. It's clear that the Pentagon has had and probably still has the greatest interest in concealing at best it can all of this research, which may cause the United States to hold a position of great supremacy over terrestrial adversaries while giving it a considerable response capability against a possible threat coming from space. Within this content, it is impossible for them to divulge the sources or conclusions for this research and goals pursued because that could immediately point any possible rivals down the most beneficial avenues. Cover-ups and different formations still remain under this hypothesis an absolute necessity. Thus, it would appear natural that in the minds of the U.S. military leaders, secrecy must be maintained as long as possible. Only increasing pressure from the public opinion or a sudden rise in UFO manifestations might induce U.S. leaders and personnel of authority to change the stance. The Cometa Report from France in 1999. So here we go. In the past few months, and I know Podesta um, was pushing for it with Obama. He was involved with uh, Bill Clinton and now Hillary. They're starting to make these statements about they're going to open it up, hopefully. And what they're doing is saying there's a new nomenclature called UAPs, okay? So it's very possible that there's a couple things that might happen, but one of them may just be there's some stuff that they know or are aware of that could be getting ready to happen that they're, um, they're not going to be able to cover up anymore, folks. One of the things that's going on now, I don't know if you follow Stephen Hawking's, but he's been starting to put a lot of voice out there saying, we don't need to try and contact what's ever out there. Because when we do, we may not like what happens. There's one analogy is, it's gonna be equivalent to when Europe came into America and, and met with the natives. It didn't go well for the natives. So very well, whatever's out there could be more advanced than us and it may not go well for us. I feel confirmation trumps disclosure. There's an alternative paradigm to move forward. An event needs to be seen as a non-threatening means to maintain the orderly functioning of bo uh, body politics while admitting that we are not alone. This event is described as confirmation. That event has already occurred. Now we're going into um, four separate statements that were made. The 20 man, the phenomenon is something real and not visionary or fictitious. General Stanford, there's nothing else known in the world that can do the things except the phenomena. The Cometa Report, they demonstrate the almost certain physical reality of completely unknown flying objects with remarkable flight performances and noises apparently operated by intelligent beings. The MOD Report, Condine, the unidentified aerial phenomenon that it exists is indisputable, credited with the ability to hover, land, take off, accelerate to exceptional velocities, and vanish. They can reportably alter their direction of flight suddenly and clearly, can exhibit aerodynamic characteristics well beyond those of any known aircraft or missile, either manned or unmanned. This was in the report. And that was MOD memo 55-2-00. Which, by the way, Today, ask Nick about it. Guess who was involved in getting the report started? Nick Pope. The basics for confirmation. Secret 2000 UKI analysis of the phenomenon. Now I'm gonna read something here. It's really small and the lighting's not very good. 
But what I'm gonna try to say to you, because I wanna get this right. Okay, this was exactly what secret meant in the United Kingdom. Secret was defined as information that, comprom- that compose a, of which would, for example, raise international tension, damage seriously relationships with friendly governments, threaten life directly, or cause serious damage to operational effectiveness or secrecy of UK or our allied forces or the continuing effectiveness of highly valuable security intelligence operations. So secret is a big deal over there. Designed as an excuse, as what Dave Clark said, is an excuse to stop taking reports to close down the UFO desk. Key facts are in the documents if you know where to look and how to interpret. Released against the judgment of senior staff. Nick can talk a little bit more about that, but originally it was only supposed to stay within the MOD. It wasn't supposed to get out. The story I got was that somehow, typical government, somebody screwed up and put something in, in something referenced in a report. That was declassified, the, this particular document, not the document itself, but part, this document that included the possibility of a report. Somebody saw it and requested, requested information on what that report was, which in, in 2006, then they released it. Okay, and it was overlooked by the UFO community. All right. Again, this is part of the report, okay, that it occurs on a daily and worldwide basis, and then um, it goes into, again, and it's in bigger print about what it's able to do. It, part of the report goes into the performance of it. It cannot be, and I'm sorry, I'm having a little bit of trouble, that the, the extraordinary, even to extraterrestrial findings might account for some of these events this could only be the result of technologies which encompass scientific and engineering attributes which are well beyond even the far-term aspirations of the aerospace industry on Earth. To obtain exceptional air performance based on reports studied, a UAP vehicle exhibits both propulsion and aerodynamic characteristics at or beyond the limit of current human design and engineering capability. Now this was What this report was, and you can ask Nick more about it, was but this was designed based on all these classified documents that the MOD had. So he was allowed to review these reports and then do a report on it. And like I said earlier, a lot of the working papers are still classified, somewhat or all the way. And there's a lot of stuff even in the the overall report that is still classified. Required performance has the capability of hovering move in the atmosphere in an aerodynamic manner, which does not cause sonic booms. Bezos's man, um, maneuver capability, which is significantly beyond our current capability, and which certainly appears to be beyond what, that which is believed that humans might withstand. Apparently emits some sort of invisible field, which is the plasma part, which in close proximity can reportedly cause humans and equipment to respond in unusual ways, to include radios, vehicles shutting down, and everything else. At worst, a close-range exposure to a UAP can cause some disturbing mental and physical effects. And it goes to electronics and, um, and electrical malfunctions. Required technology, field effect propulsion. As you can see down here, what Valone said about field effect propulsion designs utilizing zero-point energy sources have the byproducts that the um, electron masses go to zero, hence inertia will also go to zero. Einstein believed that these uh, fields existed. This came out of working paper number six. Now we're going into radiation effects. Currently the field characteristics of a UAP are unknown, but it's corroborated the fact that some sort of field is emanated which has adverse effects on some people when they are close to the source. Any pursuit of this, uh, of this process of identification and elimination of EM radiation is pointless if the UAP radiation is, is other than EM radiation as we know it. It is not certain that the radiation slice fields are conventional and electric magnetic in nature. Okay, proof of my medical effects. 
the medical evidence is pervasive, but it does not prove conclusively that the magnetic fields exactly of the same type used in the Canadian experiments, MSA rate from UAPs are always the cause of the more bizarre reports. Neither does it conclusively prove that all UAPs exhibit only magnetic fields. There may be others, including even fields of which there is little current knowledge. Proximity matters. No attempt was made to consider further the physical and psychological aspects which impinge on the topic of UAPs when close encounters, including the abductee and contact, allegedly occur. It is clear, however, that such events only happen when a human is quite close to the phenomenon. In this respect, the most important findings in the potential connection between modulated magnetic fields, which, is, which seem to produce the same effects on the human minds as those experienced by those few witnesses who have been very close to a UAP. Okay, kind of sum it up, is like, some of the questions that are out there is, how come if you get close to something, different people see it different ways? Okay. Um, you can have two people standing there looking at something, and one person sees it as this, another person sees it as that. And in our case, it was that way too. I saw it one way, Peniston saw it another. And the third guy who hasn't said much, he, he saw it kind of a mixture of both. So when you get close to this, it does affect what you see and how you see it. It can manipulate you. One of the, one of the things you can look at is, I don't know if you've heard of this, it's called the God's Helmet. And it was created by a scientist called Persinger in Canada. And I'm pretty sure he was tied into this, uh, some groups It had something to do with some of this, where they would strap a helmet that they made that would put EM fields into your mind or your brain, and 95% of what people saw was God when they, when they ran this field through them and they asked them what they saw, yet God wasn't there but th these fields can affect what you see. So when, when somebody looks up in the sky and says, I saw this, somebody else saw that, or people that have said they've had close encounters, when they tried to explain it, people kind of blow them off. Well, it's probably because of the radiation, EM frequencies, you know, and terahertz radiation that's causing some of this to happen. Time anomalies. In short, the witness often reports gaps or lost time, often not accounting for up to several hours beyond current understanding. One of the extreme postulations is that UAPs are in fact genuine constructed air vehicles which use potential scientific and engineering principles which are beyond currently applied knowledge. Thus, they may have some sort of propulsion systems which would provide the extraordinary range of velocities and accelerations frequently reported. Like when people say, I don't understand how it did this, up, down, turned, and everything else. It must therefore be recognized that the methods of propulsion may in fact be possible beyond our current understanding in the United Kingdom. UAPs exhibit um, strategic interest postulated in some quarters that the frequencies and locations of UAP events might be higher in the vicinity of important national assets and strategic military establishments like Rendlesham Forest, Bentwaters. Combination of these percentages change beyond by buoyant bodies to be attributed to mainly isolated assets coupled with the presence of, of alert personnel at these sites. They often occur where there are isolated um, electronically charged objects present such as certain industrial military buildings. Now, again, this is coming from the report, okay? And one of the things in there would be radars, okay? Radar technology, when it says buildings and certain industrial military buildings, would also involve radars and that type of technology. Other nations' interest as there is no formal intelligence exchange on this topic, however, there's a redacted area, are known to have at least one member of their stacked a staff active in this area. Russian, former Soviet republics, and Chinese authorities have made a coordinated effort to understand the UAP topic. Russian investigators have measured fields which are reported to have caused human effects when they are located close to the phenomenon. The Chinese, when they told me 
this was from, you'll see who said this at the end, told me over, so it's not me, told me over and over again of the amount of evidence that they have from which they concluded the ET phenomenon is real in the sense that they are really real tangible craft penetrating their airspace, that the issue is essentially settled with them. And I said, well, this being the case, why won't you make a public announcement? Tell the world about this reality. And there was a short embarrassed silence and it was stated, China will be a quick second after the United States makes the announcement. C.B. Scott Jones to Linda Moulton Howe. Okay, one of the things that the report talks about and in some of the reason for national security issues is the fact, and I think everybody's aware of this, not just with this, but everything. Each side wants to make the other side think they have more than they really do a lot of times. Each side doesn't want the other side to know what they really have, and so they keep this stuff close to the vest. So when Clinton made that statement the other day, I'll, I'll open it up, I'll look at it, and we'll divulge what we can this net of national security. That's a lot of what she's saying, for sure. There are gonna be things that, even though people are for open government wanna know, they're just not gonna talk about it, folks, because of the fact they're not gonna let the rest of the world know what they really have or they don't have. And sometimes when they do, they may not really even have it. This just may be a ruse to get the Russians worked up or the Chinese worked up and get scared or back down and everything else. And I'll give you an example that has nothing to do with aliens. When they did that negotiations for the missiles, you know, the intercolonic ballistic missiles, the SALT Treaty, when the Americans went over to Russia and started looking at the deactivated stuff that was supposed to be taken offline, half of what they thought had missiles and it didn't. Another percentage had missiles that weren't really missiles or had salt water, which means I think it was like 50 or 60% of what we thought the Russians had that they could launch on us weren't even real. But we spent billions of dollars having more missiles to out counter the missiles that they had. So the same thing would go on with this, guys. And whoever gets it, has it, or gets it, or understands it, and can and fully utilize it is going to control the world. Okay, and unfortunately, I'm not a conspiracy guy totally, not totally, but think about this. Not only would they control the world, other military governments, and have the final say, they would also be able to control their own population, manipulate it. The Physics of High Strangeness, a 2003 paper by Jacques Vallée and Eric Davis. Challenges orthodox ufology and skeptical thinking. Argues that the high strangest must be taken into consideration when analyzing UAP reports. MOD fails to do that. Or at least what we know they did. There's a lot of stuff that's redacted, so they may have, but from what you can get out of the report, they didn't. And it proposes a six layer approach to analyzing UAP reports. There's quite a bit here, so what I'm just gonna do, because I'm gonna maybe hit a highlight here or there, but most of it's big enough you should be able to read it because I am running out of time. Okay, it's a report, elements of Valet and Davis. And one right there is the social influence on witnesses. Physical perception, non-physical perception, UAP report types map to the region, physical effects, occupies a position in space consistent with geometry, moves as time passes, exhibits light absorb and emission, when landed leaves indentations and burns, gives rise to photographic images, leaves material residue consistent with earth chemistry, gives rise to a, a magnetic and gravitational disturbances. Now, part of this covers exactly what happened to us at Rendlesham. After the fact, um, there was indentations in the ground, okay? Well, Penniston said he looked at it and didn't see any tripods or anything underneath it. I didn't see a craft, but there was no one that could explain how there could be tripads in the ground. When in actuality, if you go into Condine 
and this paper, this phenomenon will leave indentations in the ground. It also will relieve trace residue of radiation, which was recorded when they went back out to the site by Colonel Halt. Um, indentations and burns, the trees were damaged, there was sap and everything else. So this phenomenon does all that. So even if you don't see a structured craft, you know, sometimes people see these lights or they can't explain. And it seems like recently over the last two or three years, and it could be longer, there's been more and more sightings, but it's been more of more of like, not a craft, but like of lights and stuff, different colored lights, and you can't understand what it is. The anti-physical effects. Shrinking in size, growing larger, changing shape on the spot. Becoming fuzzy and transparent on the spot. Dividing into two or more craft, or several of them merging into one object. Everything was witnessed in Rendlesham that way. And um, you, you, if you've listened to Colonel Hall talk, he's brought it up, even in his tape, he mentions some of this. Disappearing at one point and appearing elsewhere instantaneously. Same thing there. Monroe Nevels was here. All of a sudden it was here. All of a sudden it was here. Not detected by radar. At some points what we had was. At some points it wasn't. Producing missing time or time dilation. Or space dilation. Object actually makes to be a small exterior in, in exterior size volume, but witnesses saw a huge interior. Appearing as balls of colored, intensely bright light under intelligent control. Condine report, it's under intelligent control. Um, different people that were out there felt it was. Matter of fact, because I'm running out of time, what do I have, like five minutes? Okay. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of end it off this slide, but I'm going to tell you some of the things with Colonel Hall. He originally said, look at the technical and more, which was this, okay? But in a different way. He now is on the record in 2000, what was it, 10, Linda? In 2010, 2009. 2009, he did a press release. I don't know if you're aware of this, but he said what we encountered was ET. The, extraterrestrial in origin and we're not alone, okay? And the funny thing about it, folks, is you wanna talk about a news blackout, right? Okay. Linda reported extensively on it at Earth Files and a lot of stuff that goes on with Rendlesham never gets to the mainstream news, um, but she does do a great job keeping it updated at all times. But, but nothing. United States, retired United States, Fulbright Colonel, does a press release. Says we're not alone. Says the um, um, UFO incident we encountered proves that we're not alone. It's a highly documented military event that cannot deny it happened. Yet nobody, nobody interviewed him. Nothing was said on mainstream news. Yet the MOD can come on and say, we're done releasing everything, folks. Trust us. No, you're not. Did they cover that, then they got busted? No, nothing was said, just a little article in the newspaper. Um, when the MOD files were released, as they were being released, and I'm gonna pick on Nick a little bit on this, and I hope that when these final files come out, he's a little bit more out there pushing for this. There was a huge gap, what was it, how many files were missing, the IS file? Uh, They've gone a missing in English and uh, never could even explain it was implying they were all gone. Right. And Nick comes out and says, well, yeah, yeah, they, they're, they're gone. They were destroyed. Um, um, and they weren't, weren't supposed to. That was against our policy. And, 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 and if they do do something like that, um, they're supposed to record who authorized it. Oh, they didn't do that. No. Um, and not only that, so we don't even know for sure when they were destroyed, but they're destroyed. And yeah, it's embarrassing, but ah, there's probably nothing to those files, <laughs> okay? Well, that's when Nick and I kind of get into it a little bit, and I have high respect for him, and he does great work and great presentations. But I wish Nick, and I hope this time, 
if he's, it, he gets, see, Nick gets all mainstream a lot. I hope Nick challenges these files when they come out. I hope he makes the public aware overall that there's a lot of stuff still being held back, even though they're telling you there's not, and that it is classified and is the defense significance. And I would have loved to see Nick, and I'm gonna close it on this, not to be negative about Nick, but one other thing. I would have loved to see him stand up for Rendlesham and open government by saying, you know, it's not acceptable that they got away with saying there's no, the files were destroyed when they weren't supposed to. I would like to see an investigation done on the House of the Floor of Lords. Okay, and not only that, it still could happen. Are you listening, Nick? Okay. Because Nick has done wonderful work. He's gotten a lot of stuff out. His presentation the other day was awesome. The book that we wrote together with Jim Pennison, Encounters and Reynolds and Forest, will be available. We'll be down there signing it. It is, in my opinion, my opinion, and you can ask Nick, it's the most definitive book right now for the times, the way Clinton has changed the word to UAPs, and the fact that Condine was introduced to the world that day in that book. Thank you, folks.